Welcome to another video in the Fixed Assets playlist. In the last videos, we have seen together the different options available to process Fixed Assets acquisition. The next process after acquisition is posting Fixed Assets depreciation. So today, let's review together the basics of Fixed Assets depreciation. What is the meaning of depreciation, why is it needed, and the different terms that are used in this area, such as accumulated depreciation, useful life, acquisition and production cost, and others. Before we start, I want to share with you a quick update on the channel status for January 2023. Today is the last day in the month, and January has been a very good month for the channel. There are 1,300 subscribers who decided to join us. Welcome to every one of you. Now the channel is at 46,100 subscribers. Also, there are 30 paying members who started supporting the channel on YouTube and two members who started supporting the channel on Patreon. Thanks a lot for your support and I will do my best to keep sharing my knowledge in interesting videos. Let's take an example. We have acquired a new machine to use in production in our factory. The price of this machine was 4,500 euros and the cost of delivery and the installation of the machine to be ready to be used in our factory was 500 euros. So the total is 5,000 euros. The acquisition cost, according to the financial standards, should include the price of the asset and any other expense that we spend in order to get this asset ready to be used in the production process or to be used and start adding value to the company. So all of these costs should be included in the acquisition and production cost. In our example, we have the price 4,400 and delivery and installation is 500. So the total is 5,000 euros. We know from experience that this type of machines can be used for four years and then we have to get rid of it because it is outdated or because it can no longer be used in production in the right way. So we either sell it as a scrap or we sell it for spare parts. So the useful life of this asset is four years. Useful life is the total time that the asset can be used to generate economic value to the organization. This can either be full years or it can also be a number of months. So for example, the useful life can be three years and two months or four years and six months and so on. After the useful life, we expect that this asset can be sold as a scrap or for spare parts for the value of 200 euros. This is called the residual value and it is the value that will remain from the asset at the end of its useful life. So the acquisition and production cost is 5,000 euros and the residual value of the asset is 200 euros. So the difference is 4,800 and this is our depreciation base. So what is the depreciation expense and why do we need to post it? Now let's look into the financial entries that we have over the lifetime of the asset. When we post the fixed asset acquisition, let's take a very simple example. We will have a debit to the machine's fixed assets account for 5,000 euros and a credit to accounts payable, supplier accounts for 5,000 euros. And let's say that this happened in 1st of January 2023. And as we said, the useful life of the asset is four years. And at the end, we will have a residual value of 200. So through the, fo the four years, we are going to consume from the value of the asset, we are going to consume the 4,800 euros. Now at the end of the useful life, so in 31st of December 2027, after four years, instead of having a value of 5,000 in the machines in our balance sheet, we will have a value of only 200. Now, let's say we will not post any depreciation or anything. So in our balance sheet, in every year, in every period through the four years, we always have a value, a net value of our fixed assets for the machines of 5,000 euros. And then we come at 31st of December 2027, after the useful life, then we have to post a loss of 4,800, the total value of depreciation through all the period. So all of this will hit only one period at the end of the useful life. And this doesn't match with the financial standards. The financial standard says that whenever we use something to generate value at the same period, at the same month, we have to post the expenses that will match with this, with the usage of this asset. So now this asset has actually been used for four years. It doesn't make sense. And it's not fair that we post all the consumption in one period at the end of the four years. And instead of doing this, we will split this value over all the periods we have in the useful life. So now we have a value of 4,800 euros and we have a useful life of four years. If we multiply four years by 12 months, so we have 48 months, 
which means we have a depreciation expense of 100 euros per month. So every month we are going to post a financial entry of a debit to depreciation expense for 100 and a credit to accumulated depreciation for machines for 100. As you see in the credit side, we are using an accumulated depreciation account. We are not posting credits to the fixed assets itself. The value of the fixed asset acquisition in our balance sheet will always remain the same and will not be impacted by the depreciation expense. Instead, we post the depreciation against an account that's called accumulated depreciation. And this account is mentioned in the balance sheet under assets under our fixed assets value. So we'll have our fixed asset value with a positive sign and then we have our accumulated depreciation with a negative sign and then we have the net which will show us the value of the fixed assets after depreciation. But the acquisition cost of the asset will always be visible in our balance sheet. It is never impacted by the ordinary depreciation that we post every period. There are other things like extraordinary depreciation or other things that can impact the acquisition cost but the ordinary depreciation is never posted to the acquisition and production cost. It's always posted to accumulated depreciation. So now let's say after one year, we will have an accumulated depreciation of 1,200. 100 euros multiplied by 12 months is 1,200. And the acquisition cost of the machine is still the same, 4,800. So the value that we will have in our balance sheet is 4,800 minus 1,200 will give us a net of 3,600 and we will continue our depreciation through the useful life of the asset. So now we understand the meaning of depreciation expense and accumulated depreciation expense. The depreciation method we use to calculate the depreciation in our example, we took the full depreciation base of the asset and we divided it by the number of periods available through the useful life and we got a fixed share for every period. This is called the straight line method. These are called depreciation methods, or in SAP, they are also called depreciation keys. And there are many other methods available. In the financial standards, there is a lot of space available to every company to decide what is the useful life and what is the depreciation method they want to use. There are other methods. For example, there is something called double declining method. There is diminishing value method and many others. I will leave you some links in the description of the video if you are interested to explore. And also I will leave you links to the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, that talk about the depreciation, which are uh, IFRS 16 and IFRS 36, I believe. I will leave you the links in the description. Now we understand the basics of depreciation expense and why do we need depreciation. Let's add an additional part. So what if we have to report all our financial statements based on two different financial standards. So in our group, we have to report using IFRS, but for the local standards, we have to use local accounting standards. And there are differences in asset depreciation between these two. So for example, in IFRS for the machine, I have the option to choose the useful life and I have chosen that I will depreciate the asset over four years. But according to the tax and the local requirements in the country I'm in, we cannot depreciate this machine on more than three years. So the useful life in the local standards will be only three years. Now you see, this means that the depreciation expense posted every period will be different between IFRS and our local standards. This is called parallel accounting. I have already created a video explaining what is parallel accounting, how it can be used in SCEP, and the difference between the ledger approach and the account approach. I will leave you a link here. So if we have two different financial standards, in this case, in every period, we are not going to post only one financial entry, but we will post two different financial entries. One entry to represent every financial standard. So for example, there will be the entry for, for IFRS, which is a debit to depreciation expense and a credit to accumulated depreciation for 100 euros. And then the other posting will be for the local standards, also a debit to the depreciation expense and a credit to accumulated depreciation for the value that is relevant to the local standards, let's say 150 euros, for example. This can be achieved in SCEP by using different depreciation areas. So for every accounting standard we use, we have to create at least one depreciation area. We will see more details about this in the system demo video. There is also more complication if we have to report our financial statements in different currencies. So for example, for our group, we have to report in euros, but in our local country, we have to report in USD. So whenever we post any transaction, we automatically translate it to the local currency, USD, with the foreign exchange rate that's available in the date of the transaction. So when we, when we post the fixed asset acquisition for 5,000 euros, it will be translated to USD with the foreign exchange rate available when we posted the fixed asset acquisition. 
But here there is a very important note. For the fixed asset depreciation, every period, it will be calculated independently for every currency. It will not be translated. This is how we guarantee that at the end, in both currencies, we will have the correct value for fixed assets. So when we did the fixed asset acquisition, the 5,000 euros was translated to USD. But then in every period when we post the depreciation expense, the system will calculate the depreciation based on the total value divided by the total number of periods. This will be calculated separately for the euro and calculated separately for USD. It will not be translated. Because if we translate the depreciation expense value from euro to USD every period, in USD, we will have different depreciation values every period because the foreign exchange rate changes. So this is not correct. In order to have the correct value, we will calculate the depreciation separately for every currency. This is it for the overview and the basic terms. So now we understand well what is the meaning of acquisition production cost, residual value, depreciation expenses, accumulated depreciation, useful life, depreciation methods, depreciation keys, and also how to use depreciation areas, and parallel accounting and parallel currencies with fixed assets. In the next video, I will show you this overview and these terms in SAP S4HANA. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again soon.